Hello and welcome. I'm Al Barrows, and this is UFO Disclosure, the podcast that's meant to show an average person's reaction to all the UFO, UAP news from everywhere and anywhere. Today, I have the pleasure and honor of having Eve Lorgan on as a guest. She is a dedicated counselor, a hypnotherapist, an author, and an anomalous trauma researcher. She began her pioneering work with alien abductees and mind control victims while earning her master's degree in psychology with an emphasis on marriage and family counseling and trauma. She also holds a biochemistry degree and was a scientist in the biochemistry industry. Eve is the founder of a support group in San Diego, California for experiencers of anomalous trauma. She continues to help hundreds of trauma victims worldwide today. She's also the author of two books, The Love Bite, Alien Interference in Human Love Relationships, and she's also the author of her current book, The Dark Side of Cupid, Love Affairs, The Supernatural, and Energy Vampirism. Thank you so much for uh, being on UFO Disclosure and for being ready. Usually my guests uh, aren't that ready. I don't know if I'm ready. Uh, (laughs) Um, So I wanted to talk to you about a number of things. Obviously, your books, Love Bite and The Dark Side of Cupid. Um, And coincidentally, you know, I thought it was a coincidence that Valentine's Day is like two weeks away. So it's really good timing. Um, Wanted to talk to you about hypnotic uh, regression um, because... Uh, there's so many doubters out there, and um, I also at times express some misgivings about hypnotic regression. But then I started thinking, you know, one of my first interviews with um, Kathleen Martin, she pointed out that uh, Betty and Barney Hill um, went to a hypnotist and had their memories um, come back through hypnotic regression. And that's one of the cases that is um, solid. I mean, no one ever doubts their testimony. I thought some of the stuff that you wrote, I mean, most of it is excellent. But uh, do you mind if I quote from your book? Yeah, just it, tell me where I can follow yeah. along. I forgot a lot of details, you know, it's been many years. Well, this so. is from The Love Bite in Chapter 3, and I don't have the specific page here, but this is just to highlight um, the point that I'm making about uh, hypnotic regression. You say that after two years of group work, it dawned on me that the love bite dramas arose from each participant spontaneously. I was careful not to lead, coach, or make suggestions as I did the interviews and was always careful to avoid post-hypnotic suggestions. And when I read that, I thought, you know, how much more careful can you be? I know that a lot of um, the stereotypes uh, that we see um, in on these TV shows of people giving testimony of being abducted, um, they've gone to a, a hypnotic regression session, um, but the majority of abductees don't do that. And I think you pointed that out in your book. And um, I did a podcast on Jim Sparks. His wow. recall was 95% conscious. He never went to a, a hypnotic regression session. So his is crystal clear. And um, after having hypnotic regression, it seems that people's memories just come back and they're sure about those memories. Um, I was very curious about that. I mean, I've had my own situations and I'm sure a lot of people out there in my audience have foggy memories of things that they'd like to clear up. Um, So that's the reason why I brought that up, because you're a licensed hypnotist and you have countless decades of years of experience. And I was wondering how you filtered through people that are good liars, (laughs) hoaxers, you know, because there's so many out there and I'm sure that you've encountered them. And it's so hard to filter them out because they're so good and they're able to uh, fool very many people. I really love your work and it's 
unusual because none of the ufologists, none of the researchers have looked at the impact that these abductions have had on families or even relationships. That's why your work is so unique and valuable, I think. Um, so I was just, you know, curious as to how you dealt with that. How do you know that you're dealing with a, um, a real abductee or just a wannabe? Oh. <clears throat> well, the real ones um, tend to not really want to, to go there sometimes. And they don't necessarily want to go public. And they really sometimes wish that they were crazy. <laughs> yeah. So wannabes might be the ones who are <clears throat> kind of ogling over maybe a positive representation of some um, E.T. space brother light beings who are here to help us ascend or raise our consciousness or rescue us. <clears throat> and so we see that more in the, the circles where it's um, more channeling based as opposed to experiencer based with trauma. So um, usually you could recognize trauma in someone. And so I could tell, uh, you know, if someone's been traumatized, then I know at least something has happened. But um, yeah, the wannabes, you know, you could pretty much tell, but then sometimes they actually had experiences and they want to believe something that feels better than maybe a deep conflict inside which often happens if you've had an abduction experience that was traumatic or unpleasant, but it hasn't come to the full awareness, but you know something happened and you may want to, I mean, this is what I did in my early life, kind of navigate towards, let's hear more about the positive ones and what they're here for, because I thought that's what it was about. And then I found out it wasn't that way uh, in a lot of the cases. In fact, most with abductions. So I guess to go back to if someone's lying there's methods, I suppose, you could look with body language and eye movement. Um, I just get a gut instinct, more or less. Um, but there was somebody I know, a colleague, actually, um, James Bartley. I'll just go ahead, because he actually had a case where he knew someone was deliberately putting in disinformation in the, quote, UFO, ET, paranormal community some years ago. It was probably in the early 2000s. Um, and that had written a book about these, I don't know, I think it had to do with these positive um, dolphin beings, spiritual beings and channeling and associating it with maybe some ETs or something. <clears throat> and he seemed to be very successful in publishing this book and having a publisher and, you know, making money and doing all these lectures. But with, I think it was a secret coded kind of way that James Bartley was able to communicate with this man. He was like an operative who was deliberately infiltrating the community to put forth this agenda, which helps promote um, like basically a positive cover over other things. And I think that if there's human, we can call it secret government, who have made alliances with some kind of shady characters in these extraterrestrial realms, whether underground or elsewhere, then they won't want those testimonies to come forth. So they're going to want to cover it up with other things so that it's just kind of covered up. So they'll put in their people to, you know, infiltrate a community so they will have a particular opinion that's much more popular. And, and then they will overshadow it with their tactics, with their infiltrators. So we did find that to be true in the community. So, and this is why uh, my mentor, Barbara Bartholick, had worked really hard to find her own ways of going much deeper in someone's experiences in hypnosis, where she was able to identify um, if something was maybe a cover memory, or there was really much more that needed to be unearthed <clears throat> inside someone, she was able to go at it and then find um, basically the, the screen memories and what was underneath. So that kind of clued me in that there's several layers sometimes to, uh, we know this now with programming in, um, let's say, secret space program, some of the my labs where they're used with human groups who've made alliances with certain alien groups. And then when they've uncovered their programming with certain methods, um, like an old case, an old person, not old, but um, Michael Relf was someone who had come to me for an interview about working on Mars, like uh, it was the Mars records. And his partner at the time, who became his wife, helped do 
many uh, deprogramming sessions with a particular method that did a galvanic response of um, releasing emotional tension along with uh, spiritual liberation and deliverance prayers. So he used a, a Christian methodology to get the demonic layering done with first and then worked with the deprogramming on the other levels that were put in by his uh, programmers, which some of them were human and some of them were alien. So basically, you know, he knew right then years ago that, you know, if you're not dealing with some kind of spiritual releasement deliverance level, you're going to have a harder time getting through screen memories and the things that these beings want to lock in or create amnesia. So it, it created basically a split in the community with um, we want it to be. It's always like it's all positive, all negative, And people have a trigger against um, if it's negative or demonic or, you know, whatever you want to call it. They won't want to go there because they want to believe a particular belief system that encourages that. Now that so there's a lot of black and white stuff going on. And then, they, then you get fights and conflicts, which really is part of how they keep the truth from emerging. So you have to just keep at it. Well, I know that um, few people uh, resort to hypnotherapy um, because of the negative uh, outlook on that sort of thing. Um, and I have to commend you for doing your research and writing your books because some of that uh, negative negativeness can rub off on an author or researcher as well uh, when you involve yourself in abductions and the paranormal. So I thank you and I commend you and I have a lot of respect for you for um, doing this work. And there's a lot of fear involved and opinions against uh, hypnosis and uh, abductee victims. Um, so a lot of it is discouraged. And um, by writing your book, it helps a lot of people come out and deal with these experiences. If I may, um, I'd like to um, move on to um, the love bite and start out by reading another quote um, that was written at the end of the first chapter of the love bite. And um, you write, I believe the UFO community needs to address some very deep psychological issues. Thousands, possibly even millions of people are suffering at the hands of a non-human intelligence. I put that in there. I think you had ETs, non-human intelligence over which we have no control. The greatest pain comes from broken hearts, ruined relationships, and shattered families created by aliens. I remember reading in a certain part of your book that really touched me. Um, you said that when you realized that, you knew that you had to publish your work and your case studies. How much was missing in the in the current time? Even now, though, I think I think a lot of it is dominated by um, the desire to have a scientific uh, left brain kind of um, a validation that gives it you know, the stamp of truth. And so if anything is less than the scientific method, um, then it then it's not valued. But what I saw was like, oh my goodness, look behind these people's experiences that may have been reported by, a, let's say, a researcher, like what they remembered with maybe without hypnosis and like a, somebody who's just from a research perspective who wants to say, uh, well, they just want to find the medical or the scientific evidence that this occurred with, you know, whatever, but they're not looking into, well, what's going on in the private life of this person and their family history? What else to remember? What are the things that are going on that suggest there's more than just, you know, the physical hybrid medical exams, for example, which is like a really common thing now that people know. And there's much, much more. So that's what we learned from getting together and talking about all these other allegedly anecdotal experiences but they're not. They're they're part of the whole thing. So there's much more going on with the lives of the people and how they're being interacted with. So yeah. I, I'd say the trauma in the family was like a big thing, especially with people like, I don't know, in the early days, maybe the younger ones are remembering more. But in the early days, oftentimes we wouldn't like say remember our experiences until we were in our 30s or our 40s. And we're, we're already married. We have kids. We're married to our first partner or whatever. And then when the memories surface and we start realizing there's this whole reality out there and we want to investigate it and connect with others who understand, that throws um, 
stress on a marriage with a partner who just doesn't hold that ability to um, look at this reality. They, they can't handle it. And sometimes they're being manipulated not to, to maintain the secrecy and the mind control of if someone's in a project and those beings, whether they're aliens or humans, don't want them to wake up and remember because it, it affects their project or the security, um, then they're going to manipulate the family system to keep it in such a handled way. And a lot of times that's through chaos and not being able to really speak the truth or really communicate effectively or love in a healthy way. Okay, so this is what I found with mostly the ones who've had maybe the more malevolent kinds of beings or the secret space program or the MyLab things. They had a lot of dysfunctional family systems, which led back to a lot of the occult blood oath secret society family members like Freemasons, for example, and then aerospace, military, industrial complex, alphabet soup agency, uh, family connections. And that led me down a road that was probably much different than what many other researchers have done, because it tells me that there's much more going on than just, quote, alien abductions or programs. Eve, if I can just stop you there. Um, I just want to... Um fill in the audience my labs are military abductions that's a word that's not commonly known um, well, it's military and alien so right it was i think it was helmet lammer as well as carla turner but not only people had military independently or with aliens who are working together or the aliens would come and get you independently away from the military so it would be like both like uh the case uh, leah haley and I know I, I I listened to that. So she was one of the original ones who really came out. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I love her. Um, before we get deep into that, because I want to get into that, can we, um, just for my audience, can we describe the indicators of a love bite? How do you know you've been love bitten? And I think that you point out in your book that you're not talking about just anybody that has um, a love affair that's gone wrong. Uh, usually these people are former abductees and they continue to be abducted throughout their lives and controlled and manipulated. Uh, alien interference, I think is what you call it. Um, and you actually break it down. You have indicators as to what is a love bite? How do you know if you've been love bitten? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because love obsession was a really big part of that. Um, as if it was almost being switched on. Um very interesting how that happens. But love obsession is not the only thing. It would be um, if someone remembered, um, oftentimes that's, that's why I put in the cases like the Ted Rice case, the Linda Cortile, and some of the other ones where, um, let's say, after the onset of an obsession in adult life, um, as they proceeded in the drama of the love obsession, which can open up a lot of areas of someone's life and their energy field, including their kundalini, but sometimes they will have spontaneous memories that emerge as a result of this uh, connection with someone else that has been engineered. So then they may remember, oh, well, they were taken as children. They were like put together as children and then maybe as teenagers and they were kind of bonded, even if they lived across the country or even in another country. Um, then they may meet later and they realize, oh, my God, I've had experiences with them. And so and sometimes it's trauma bonding under different situations and circumstances which ex basically exacerbates the connection <clears throat> and then uh, during the love obsession a lot of times there's many more abduction like visitation experiences or dreams like astral connections with the other person with the aliens or with the aliens interacting more so that's one uh, indicator so that might have been in the book and of course the increase in the paranormal factor instant psychic uh abilities where you didn't have them before when except when you got connected with this person you may have past life memories that that come up with this person or, or just an increase in surveillance with uh, the military factor if you're a my lab i i don't think it's just a love obsession through the classic uh attachment trauma style that that is coming up very much in the uh, narcissistic abuse uh, circles for therapists and people who are survivors who don't even have, let's say, the alien stuff, but the classic narcissistic abuse or uh, the connection between a narcissistic personality style with, let's say, a codependent, and there's a very strong, obsessive, 
uh, almost twin flame kind of thing, but then it, it has a particular dynamic that plays out, which actually is abusive more to the person on the codependent end. And so sometimes those styles of relationship is similar <clears throat> to what plays out in an alien love bite. But the difference is the alien love bite, the person knows they're an abductee or had many alien experiences, and they may remember being set up with someone else who's also one and that kind of thing. So starts that, in childhood, doesn't it? They get paired up in childhood? Yeah, or or teen. Yeah, I right. believe a teenager. And yeah. one is left confused and drained of energy um, because the other switches off, I guess. Uh, yeah, a lot of the times that happens. And and sometimes that happens right after they were taken. So they're, they have this joint connection where they both feel something, one sometimes more than the other. And then an abduction happens uh, where they basically switch off the other person somehow energetically or maybe post-hypnotic suggestions. And then that person is just basically switched off psychically, leaving the other one feeling in unrequited love, but still very psychically connected. I mean, they're still feeling them. They're still like remote viewing what they're feeling, what they're thinking, what they're doing. I mean, it's amazing what happens. So uh, that uh, switching off is also described uh, in the Ted Rice case, which was the Carla Turner's uh, overview of his entire biography of abdu abductions. Then I just did the just the love bite and relevant portions to basically demonstrate, well, this is what happened in his case, and this is how he remembered it when he was taken with another girl at 14 years old. They were both the same age, went to the same school. There actually was a group abduction, and he got more memories because Barbara Bartholick was able to go through. Basically, the long story short was that when they did this connection, and they did something with a an instrument that weaved in the heart essence of Ted inside the heart essence of the woman. And I don't know, it was some kind of instrument, but it didn't get the reverse. So her, his essence wasn't basically weaved into her heart. So he was really connected and felt as if his soul was merged with her after that happened. And like instant love obsession uh, and caring and a very strong soul connection, but she didn't have the same thing, but she right. still was a friend, but it played out in, in a way that basically would be a very dysfunctional, um, you know, unrequited love kind of situation, which begs the question, well, why did they do it in the first place? Exactly. Um, people assume, oh, well, they're putting people together because they want them to have children together and it's a hybrid program and that it's not always the case. A lot of times they're married to somebody else and they don't have kids with the partner. And so there's a whole other, and I put that in the love bite, like the main reasons why I think this is taking place. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're dealing with implants, hybridization, like you said, and now the love bite. But um, I'd like to transition into uh, psychic or energy vampirism. Um, and you have a case in chapter 15 of the love bite. And the title of the chapter is Suzanne. And uh, she has to deal with a roommate by the name of Marie. <laughs> yeah really sabotages her left and right throughout. Suzanne has her own business going and Marie comes in and just uh, poaches all her clients and just really drains her aura and her energy away. Um, is that a classic case of um, energy vampirism or psychic vampirism? Um, or is actually, that just a bad roommate? No, it's actually a case of a handling. When I look back, I mean, there was energy vampirism with some of the beings involved, but um, overall, this case turned out to be um, the, the roommate was probably led and handled and manipulated by a malevolent being um, running her with her, I think it was a psychic business of some sort, and she wanted basically the the clients that Suzanne had in her support group because they were right. experienced. And but but it basically was a hijack, was an infiltration, hijack handling. Okay, and this this is classic. With if you're bringing forth information that is a little bit unsettling, and not according to what maybe some alphabet soup agencies or beings don't want us to know about, even the good, bad, and the ugly, the whole thing, then they're going to send in an infiltrator who's an easily manipulated person, often mind controlled or just run by the entities themselves to infiltrate 
and do what they do and then hijack and and then basically um, almost kind of like destroy this woman's um, initial efforts towards having a support group and her own business and her life and her investigation to her own experiences. So this is actually, I'm going to go a step forward because of course, energy vampirism occurs, but in this kind of case, you see an infiltration that is a co-optation to change the narrative and basically try to stop the person from discovering fully the truth of their experiences. So it would shut them down from a healing process and a sharing, which would be beneficial towards others wanting to recover from what are the deeper truths behind their experiences. So that's that's one method that's very, very common. Uh, but the energy vampirism is something that occurs with um, what I'll call it a third-party entity situation where you have a person who's maybe in a love bite or an engineered relationship. Um, and this is in the dark side of Cupid too. It's more um, it's more about the energy vampirism where there's right. a third party entity that might be hosting or partially oppressing another individual that's easily manipulated to maybe uh, connect with the quote targeted partner or the abductee. And then they get together and they have a relationship, but they're, the being working behind them and compelling certain behaviors, which is very similar to a narcissistic personality disorder or borderline. So that would be a classic um, energy vampirization, psychic vampirization based on the the chaos, which is described in the um, dark side of Cupid, even in the love bite where you look at like, what's the whole dynamic of how this plays out? you know, initial strong connection, it seems okay. But then as the relationship proceeds on deeper levels, oh, you've got this weird paranormal stuff and all of a sudden this inner interference starts happening and they start having more interactions with aliens or maybe with demons or weird paranormal activity. And then there might be, you know, dramas, all this drama happens and, you know, could be very dramatic that seems to come at them without their control, like a roller coaster of high drama and crashing highs, you know, highs and crashing lows, and the classic drama chaos that could be instigated by an entity working through someone who might have a primary personality disorder. Prevalent with the chaos factor and the, you know, the highs and the crashing lows and the endless carrot being dangled and switching on, switching off. It's like, okay, this is classic. And that's energy vampirism. Yeah. I seem to be getting off on energy or any type of energy, negative or positive. I know yeah. you talk about uh, uh, Kundalini energy and how um, they drain that off. Uh, but I mean, even suffering, they they get some sort of a loose uh, energy resource from that. Aliens need to farm emotional energy, do you think? Yes. Uh, well, depending on what their specific program is but my sense is that it's it's part of a life force that's connected to the eternal spirit connection that we as humans have innately that somehow these beings have been unable to connect to directly in their own being so they have to secondarily acquire it through any form of emotion sexual energy kundalini energy or even blood sacrifice life energy of souls so that's what i think is happening but there may be a number of projects and agendas that go with their whole farming thing so it could appear as if they're playing on both sides of the fence uh and that actually is is barbie saw that we saw that a lot with some beings where it seemed like oh well like these beings are playing on both sides of the fence they might be having, let's say, a, a group of people where, you know, their program and their connections are going to be basically positive. They're going to have these wonderful healings take place and they might get involved in channeling or promoting these beings as, you know, benefiting us in ascension or something. And then another group might be uh, where they're just using them as the hybridization um, people who basically have children who are hybrids and they may want to do something else with um, the super abilities with you know, athletics or scientific ability or psychic ability, and then they get grafted in a project. And some of them may be just like these horrible negative beings who don't care how they treat them. And so that that's kind of a, a broad statement. But we do know now, based on how 
this was exemplified clearly in, in the Ted Rice case, which is overviewed in the Love Bite, as well as one of the cases in the Dark Side of Cupid. Um, actually, um, I think it's called Mariah and the Spirit Guide. But the woman's name, now I could name it, she has passed away uh, along, so it's okay to speak her name, but her name was Mary Henry. And so it turns out that Ted Rice and Mary Henry actually had joint experiences together even after the experiences were written down of the primary stories in my book. So it, it's interesting. But in the Mary Henry case, the same kind of thing happened. If you read the case, it, it starts out one way where she's in a classic old-fashioned kind of abduction scenario, being taken like in her car on the way to work in a physical way, um, missing time, you know, an hour and a half or so on her way to work, goes to work, is late, you know, an hour and a half, but nobody notices. They just don't notice. And wasn't that interesting? But after the abduction, she had like really bad arthritis in her hands. But then afterwards, it was like she was healed. And it was like, oh my God, you know, what happened? Her hands were healed and it was just so wonderful. So some of the initial hypnotic regressions she got from another uh, psychiatrist, this is before she met Barbie, there was um, a series of things that were remembered about aliens and what, what they were wearing and the healing they did. And But she felt no fear and thought that it was benevolent. She was almost in love with them, these, these beings who, I think it was like a Nordic type that presented its image that way. But as she went deeper in experiences with Barbie, she came to find out that they were, they were playing a con job with her as she got involved in actually doing automatic writing first, which kind of proceeded into channeling automatic writing and demonic oppression to almost possession. So this was written about in my book. But it showed the progression of how they, they'll play both sides of the fence where, you know, it turns out to be one thing and then all these other beings start becoming involved. And it's, it's just really a fascinating case. Um, so that's why I put it in there so that people can see, you know, they think they're being told, oh, well, I have a special mission at this time in Earth when all these changes, I'm going to be an ambassador. And they're, you know, being bonded with these high level beings to have a homunculus astral child and and all these things. And then, then it progresses into the prophecies not coming true, by the way, and her, you know, passing away without having been the ambassador. And so it kind of tells you what, what are they doing just to get our attention to promote them, even if their prophecies don't come true. They, so it's, it's a, it's a bit of a, a flattery and deception to make you feel special. You're on this myth, myth, drama mission, to to do something good and to help fight this war but it's a game or it not, appears to be some of them now that yeah. you say uh, a war it's almost a war on a spiritual level um it's almost as though um you're fighting for your own soul uh, because if you give in to these uh, manipulation and interference uh, you pretty much get sidetracked from really finding out who you really are and what your mission is in life. I agree. Um, which it's I, I mean, that's why your work is so important. Uh, people need to realize when they're being distracted. And um, we're so ignorant as to, you know, how this can happen. The majority of us don't even know it's happening, but we're being manipulated. Um, there appears to be also, like you said, a human element involved in conjunction with the UFO um, phenomenon. Aliens are using human operatives, like you mentioned before. Um, my lab's military abductions, in Leah Haley's case, she was abducted yeah. by the aliens, um, crashed in one of their craft, and then was re-abducted, yeah. par paramilitary or military group. Um, and they probably treated her worse than the aliens did, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. that's actually been the case for many. Yeah. I mean, either way, it's a violation of human rights and uh, definitely a lack of respect uh, for your dignity. I thought uh, Leah Haley was very compelling uh, because uh, she, you know, here's this very um, conservative woman, uh, never involved in anything paranormal, um, all of a sudden realizes that um, she may have been abducted as a child 
and then goes on to find out that um, she's continuously being abducted and manipulated. And unfortunately, it was a classic case um, where she lost her family. I mean, even her daughters didn't want her at their wedding. So sad. I, that happens a lot yeah. with people who discover and, you know, it, it does break up families, um, which is, I think that's why I wanted to take the therapeutic approach as opposed to put the researcher hat because there was so many things that I saw was like, wait a minute, you know, there's these families and relationships being, you know, manipulated or destroyed or, you know, chaos deliberately put in the family system as a result of some of this. And that, you know, what we need to do is what is healthy? What is a healthy, good relationship? And what is healthy love? And and really relearning, well, what is a healthy family system and relationship? And how have we kind of normalize things that are not that to such an extent that we don't even know that we're in a dysfunctional relationship, for example, right. family system or, you know, government or school or, you know, all kinds of things. Therapeutic modalities that you talk about in your books. And if I understood um, the narrative correctly, the after effects of these mind controls um, are probably the worst to work with as far as a therapist. Um, you're dealing with amnesia, um, repressed memories, denial on the part of the abductee, enforced secrecy from the powers that be, and even by the abductees themselves, they refuse to admit what happened to them. These lead to other problems, don't they? I mean, and, and other symptoms in your life. I mean, they have to. Like complex PTSD is a big thing where before, you know, they talked about post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and that's very relevant with terms of, you know, how people can react to that from combat and different abuse situations. But complex PTSD is when you have pervasive, lifelong from childhood forms of trauma that basically create a personality style and a nervous system dysregulation oftentimes that deals with chronic stress. And so that makes it hard to recover. And we have to you know, recover our nervous systems and our sense of safety. And, you know, people don't realize a lot of people are dealing with complex trauma as a way of life. I wonder, though, you know, once you fall prey to this sort of manipulation and uh, you're not winning the quote unquote spiritual war, how do you fight against this? You know, these after effects, you know, it's like a fight to save your very soul. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what chance do we stand and, you know, what can we arm ourselves with? How do you reclaim your power, in other words? And this is basically for myself and everyone listening um, that needs help because you become blind. I mean, when you're involved in this, you pretty much don't realize it. Um, you become disassociated from who you really are. And it's only afterward, I think, and you would be the one to tell me whether I'm right or not. You don't realize it until afterward in hindsight. Yeah, because usually they take you, if you are a classic abductee, they do take you from childhood, I think before age three, if you ask me, based on other research, which means, you know, there's conditioning deep in your psyche. So that's, that's a thing. But I think that if we can recover from trauma, even with the standard understanding of psychology and the nervous system and you know, balance what is healthy relationships, we can go very far with our recovery of our own uh, sovereignty to a certain degree from not being as uh, influenced by these forces that will continue to try to do it because it's it's their nature to do that. So we have to understand what is human nature versus what is not truly human. And that's the part that can be a little bit difficult. But I will say spiritually, for me, if you could recover from your trauma, I found that, um, you know, faith in Jesus Christ was something that helped me from a, from an early age, even though I had been really manipulated and hurt in my life, even long after I had that faith and that connection. And it really led me to, to go into many different spiritual uh, groups and practices to try to uncover trauma and just go deeper into lucidity, like Buddhist meditation practice and lucid, lucid dreaming. So 
I'm not going to poo-poo these things that can help us, you know, have a calm mind and a calm body and to reconnect with deeper, let's say, dissociated parts of ourself, because that's really important. So, but I still think the power of Christ tended to be the most powerful against high-level demonic forces and even um, certain aliens to a certain degree. Not everybody would, would agree with me there, but I'm thinking, you know, it's better to be on the safe side as long as you don't give your power away to those who display, let's say, a hijacked spiritual cult group or religion. And so that's something that I haven't even really written about in those two books so much, but in the later works that I've done with people who come to me now with supernatural traumas, um, with a lot of this has to do with the, the twin flame thing or the false twin flame thing, or they were in a cult led by a guru, and it could have been a minister or preacher of a particular um, faith, but, but they were hijacked by these self-same entities, reptilians, dracos, or high-level false light beings, for lack of a better term, that will vampirize or misdirect or deliberately deceive to basically throw people off the track from true authentic connection. So that, that I ran into a lot more like high level dangerous ones that connect with hundreds, if not thousands of people. And then they're being manipulated by these underlings of this high level demon kind of thing. And sometimes there's aliens being seen by psychics who are not like classic abductees. And I've I've run into this a lot where certain people who are very, uh, let's say naturally clairvoyant and they're just naturally that way. And they'll see, uh, let's say, in their third eye or interdimensionally, like alien greys popping in and out of walls or reptilians or Nordics and particular types of beings that may have certain symbology associated with certain secret fraternal organizations. I won't name them. But during certain astrological windows, having technologies of soul capture. Okay, so they'll try to, you know, let's say go into hospital rooms and somebody's ready to pass over. And they're hanging out because they want to capture that soul. And so clairvoyance can actually perceive these things going on. And they, they may not be an abductee. They just, but they'll see the same kinds of entities that look like alien greys. So begs the question, you know, all the different levels these beings are operating on and what images they're, they're taking that people are picking up psychically. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a spiritual war going on and that we, we need to really know who we are. And this goes back to um, what we identify with. And this is part of the problem in what I'm saying, uh, what I'm seeing as a, let's say, a hijack of humanity to over-identify and ogle over these gods and demigods and how wonderful these ETs are. And I'm a hybrid and I come from this system or that system. And they start to identify with the ET as opposed to the human that is the original Uh, that is connected to the eternal spirit. So if we identify with the other, we're giving them permission to interact or interfere with us and kind of hijack the pure connection of eternal spirit and truth. So that's like a giving over of your sovereignty without really knowing it. So it really always goes back to what do we identify with? How do we just identify with our original beingness um, without... Let's say in the, in the Buddhist meditation, if you want to become clear with purity of perception, we don't want to be grasping towards, you know, loving or hating what you really are identifying with. You basically be still and observe the arisings in consciousness without identifying or grasping until you become pure in your awareness to identify with your natural beingness, which is all pervasive awareness in the eternal, connected to the eternal. So that's, I believe, the natural human. And so that's where you can get caught off track if you start, well, this is who I was in my past life, and this is who I am functioning on this other star system, and that's who I am. But that's just, to me, that's a deviation of original eternal spirit. So this is where we have to really get clear on what do we really want to identify with, and that will lead us to the truth if we go to what is more pure and simple and not all this complicated stuff. That makes sense. It absolutely does, and I believe in um, 
reconnecting with your sovereign power um, before actually seeking out uh, aliens or paranormal uh, entities. First, you have to know who you are before you intermingle with something as powerful as the paranormal. Um, I'd like to conclude by talking about the disclosure movement and how this jives with the disclosure movement, because I've been following um, the hearings and uh, the movement to try and get more transparency from the government. And I'm wondering how um, your viewpoint jives with, say, somebody like um, Dr. Stephen Greer, who is pushing the agenda that uh, all ETs are benevolent. I mean, I think he's done great things for the movement. Um, he's probably created this um, bit of transparency we're having from the government. But um, I think it's a little naive to think that all aliens might be benevolent. Um, I always think of the saying, as above, so below. Um, what do you think about that, Eve? Actually, I saw an excerpt that a French researcher, actually, it was a French researcher. It was in French, but it was an English interview. It was like a five-minute clip that Dr. Stephen Greer was being interviewed by another gentleman. I don't remember his name, but one of the questions was um, these secret projects in, in disclosure, for example, like uh, Project Looking Glass. Well, he didn't say Looking Glass. It was Project Stargate. But what's coming up now so much in the like, way, secret space program disclosure, I mean, it's the big, since 2015-ish is when it really started coming out. But before that, there were, quote, military abductees who knew they were in projects aligned with some alien groups and some alphabet soup agencies that may have certain names. Um, what does it call it? Unacknowledged special access projects. Right. But uh, anyway, the way Stephen Greer answered it was like he didn't really want to, he know he confirmed that there was such a thing, but the sources that he had, he wants to get direct sources maybe from a higher level of military or higher level government group that would confirm whether or not this Stargate program existed with respect to children being um, weaponized and then used in these projects. Well, I know that's true. And then there's been, I believe, an affidavit by Jesse Zaboder, who's a survivor of a hierarchy system elite family. This is a satanic bloodline family that they train and traumatize their own children and then will put them in these projects. And she talked about Project Stargate, Project Looking Glass, and Project um, Voice of God, as well as others, that she knows for sure that they put children in, usually from these ritual abuse hierarchy system families. They're not always bloodline, but they usually have some form of trauma that sets the stage for them to be used later um, for their abilities. So we know that's true, but but Stephen Greer didn't really want to confirm that solidly in terms of, oh yeah, he knew that kids are being used and, and weaponized. A lot of times they die young, but the truth behind that, in my view, that needs to be disclosed is the, the definite connection between these, quote, satanic bloodline, they call it Illuminati bloodline families, but there may be other names that they choose to use, like elite bloodlines. And they do this with their own children as well as others they may opportunistically take like orphans in um, Catholic schools, orphanages, or non-bloodline, but they still use them in different ways. But the foundation of their programming is done by these people who are humans, who make alliances with these other beings that um, I think do human blood sacrifice and human trafficking in their own ways. And some of them may have alien appearances in underground bases, for example. So I know those things are going on, but but the, there seems to be a, a big trigger and reticence to disclose the um, basically the satanic bloodline involvement with these alphabet soup agencies and military projects and special, what do you call it, unacknowledged access projects like the SSP things. They won't want to acknowledge that part. They want to keep that compartmentalized and it's maybe just the aliens or just the humans in these projects, but they never want to say the connection between these satanic bloodlines and the ones who are involved in the projects and with those aliens. So this is what my beef is. It's like, you know, why can't they come clean on that. Why are they always wanting to promote this benevolent ET um, thing 
And I think there may be some good beings out there. I'm not saying that there's not, but it's like, why can't they just come and fess up to this? Because this is the reality that's coming into the therapist's office. We're coming in with ritually abused people who are then put into projects and they know these projects and they know the people involved, but they get harassed and they, you know, they're often um, very severely targeted individuals. So you're not seeing a statistically significant amount that needs to come out to prove the whole, the whole ball of wax. So you're not seeing what should be seen because of the targeting. You see what I mean? I agree. You have to look at the whole picture to understand what's really going on. Before we go, um, do you want to um, talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing now? I know that um, you're working on some new healing modalities um, that involves more spiritualism. Um, well, with what I've seen, I feel like what is the most important thing that I can do for people who are coming out of knowing they've been interfered with on very high levels, high spiritual and supernatural levels from different groups, be they, be they religious or government or alphabet soup or alien, um, and with respect to trauma and dissociative uh, trauma, like complex trauma and dissociative identity disorder, which obviously in, in um, Ritual Abuse and MK Ultra, many of those projects, they deliberately do trauma to create dissociative splits to put these people in projects as assets who are trained in a specific way. So we know that dissociative identity disorder is a big part of these people's lives, including the SSP people. Uh, some of them recover better than others because their trauma splits may not be as severe because of their family systems, but it's almost always present. So we need to deal with the DID and the complex trauma very efficiently and the spiritual overlays that keep that locked in. And so if there is demonic layering that locks in amnesia and locks in programming, we must be able to get both things. So the, the method that I'm working with that I'm still learning um, it's by Diane Hawkins, who is basically a Christian ministry who works with DID and recovering, basically called the recovering with the primary identity method. So using prayers and learning how to merge the altars in the primary identities and the recovering the original self. So it's a, it's a better way because otherwise you just got altars popping off all over the place and you never get to the root of the primary identity and the core that's hiding. Because as long as the core is hiding and not being able to emerge in the body and live, you, you, you don't have a full power. You don't have full sovereignty. So recovering from DID and trauma is absolutely essential to recover your sovereignty and power, especially spiritually and in the world and in your relationships, you know? So that's what I'm learning now is like complex trauma recovery and how we can work with that with prayers and with whatever we can do, support one another to help make that possible, make it safe to share instead of getting caught up in all these little um, groups of identifying with this or with that or this group or that group. It's, it's about trauma recovery not what group you want to, you know, go and take channeled messages from. So you could you know, wait on a hill for some UFO to pick you up. <laughs> it's always about trauma recovery. So that's where you realize your true self. And until you realize your true self, you don't know what you might be interacting with. So that's my view anyway. Hmm. I'm going to show uh, your books just so that the audience can see them. Dark Side of Cupid. And I mean, feel free to comment while I'm showing these. Well, the Love Bite, you can get from me directly a hard copy because it's very expensive on Amazon and it's still available through Kindle, Amazon. Now, when and, you say uh, they can buy it from you directly, Eve, what's the web address? Oh, um, evelorgan.com. And uh, under the books, you could actually order those books, hard copy um, directly uh, up to, you know, until I run out. Um, and then both are available on Kindle as well. So, at least they're still available, just in English for now. Okay, so it's best to get the hardcover love bite directly from you. Yeah, nobody else is going to have it unless it's a second sale that costs in very much. <laughs> It'll cost a lot, yeah. Well, it was lovely having you on UFO Disclosure, Eve. Um, 
I'm hoping that possibly we can do this again in the future. And thank you for all the advice that you've given my audience. I'm sure they'll take it to heart. And uh, happy Valentine's to all you lovers out there. And um, hopefully you'll take uh, Eve's advice and uh, you'll work things out. Any last words, Eve? Um, just that I have a, a Telegram group called Alien Love Bite um, because I'm not on Facebook. So it's another way to connect with me and um, via my email at elorgan at gmail.com. So. Hey, folks, you've been listening to UFO Disclosure with Al Barrows and Eve Lorgan as a guest. All my love and good intentions go out to all. Please pray and send out good intentions for the children in Gaza and the Ukraine. They're lonely and afraid. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my podcast.